Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here, and uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm going to talk about one aspect of uh, women in um, across the world, which I think has become increasingly important over the years, which is women in politics. So in uh, I think the mid-1990s, the UN had had a conference where it had made a strong statement suggesting that women should uh, be encouraged to enter politics, and a number of countries since then have responded by introducing uh, quotas in politics. Uh, today, over 100 countries have gender quotas in politics, and what I want to do is I want to use this as an example to try to talk about some of the main themes that often come up, both when we talk about women as agents of change, but also equally when one thinks about women as entrepreneurs. So I wanted to start with just two quotes from, um, I guess, one organization here, one in New York, uh, which has often formed the basis for thinking about why we care about gender. So why is it that gender should be something that it fo forms the basis of any conversation? So the first, uh, I think, is sort of a very rights-based perspective. So uh, Kofi Annan, for instance, made this argument that if you don't see gender equality or if you see women lagging on many forums, that just is wrong. So it's an it's a ethical right, it's a moral right, and that should be sufficient justification for a number of policies that seek to bring women into the mainstream. A different argument is often made, and I think, you know, Wolfenson, when he was at the bank, once was one uh, person who pushed it, but you often hear about this idea in some sense of, it's often called, for instance, the double dividend. This idea that the reason why we want to focus on women and reduce gender gaps is because if we manage to reach women, we're going to bring about, um, we're going to unleash huge potential. I think that's quite similar to what Kislai at some level was suggesting when he said that, you know, there is a lot of talent out there that's not getting tapped. And the fact that women very often are the primary caregivers for children make many believe that there is a double dividend, that if you can tap the potential for women, you're going to actually see returns for children as well. But, you know, it's not, I think it's not that easy to make the case, uh, both uh, partly because if you see gender gaps, one of the biggest ish questions is whether this is some kind of discrimination or barriers to human capital investment that are holding women back, or is it just that men and women have different preferences? Perhaps women actually really like doing different things from men, and we should not be looking for equality on, in many fronts. A common example that people talk about from Latin America, for instance, is that in Latin America, we've seen a huge closing of the gender gap in education. If anything, women now ha tend to have more years of education than men in Latin America, but we still continue to see a very large gap in labor market outcomes. And one could make the, the case that it's, uh, it's because there are social norms or there are, there's labor market discrimination, but one needs to, I think, put a, to a slightly high, higher level of a test. In the US, I think it was around 10 years ago, um, you know, there was a series of articles on the so-called opt-out revolution, arguing that once women have, are sufficiently emancipated, we have to recognize the fact that they may want to opt out. So it's, I think given the fact that there, there is some reason to believe that preferences may differ, it's important to ask the question of you know, what holds women back? Is it, is it really the kind of things that we think public policy should be affecting, or should we just at some level recognize that we need to make the playing field equal, but beyond that, if we continue to see gender gaps, it reflects preferences. So, that's one reason I think it's interesting to focus on political leadership, because there's certainly a lot of you know, so-called facts, which are often myths, about male and female attitudes towards competition and leadership. There's a lot of, you very often hear, I certainly hear it um, at the Kennedy School, this claim that uh, you know, women don't like to compete or women are more risk averse, women don't like to be leaders. And so if these preferences are really true, then Leadership is an interesting area to ask that if you actually change the terms and you try to pull women in, is there actually a response and who are the type of women who come in? So I think I've talked about many of these issues and I think one reason why it's important to really try to put a lot more emphasis on not just looking at correlational evidence, 
but also to look at causal evidence is, first it helps us understand just what the impact of the policy is. But it also is important in thinking about whether or not we're going to see a backlash. You often now hear this concept, you often hear in policy discussions, this idea of gender fatigue, that somehow people are tired now of hearing about all the policies that are being put in place to enable women. So while the statistics are still pretty bad in a lot of dimensions, you'll often hear people saying, oh, we've had enough of uh, you know, pushing women to the front, now women are just everywhere. You look at the statistics, that's not true. And I think, again, to have a better sense of what exactly the policy has done can help you distinguish between uh, both potentially backlash arguments, but also, I think, more generally, the sort of gender fatigue that seems to set in very fast into a lot of organizations. So what I want to do today is I want to first talk quite broadly about what we do know currently about trends in female leadership. Um, I want to talk slightly about some stylized facts or discussions we've, that people have about what are the supply side and demand side constraints of leadership. And then I want to look at the case of India, which is an interesting case. It's had uh, very strong gender quotas at the local level of leadership. So in village councils, it's for the last 15 years required 33% of the seats be reserved for women. And in many states, this is now going up to uh, roughly half. At the same time, there's been a bill which has been stuck in the parliament for the last 10 years about trying to introduce similar quotas at the state and national levels, and there's been very strong resistance to it. So it's an interesting uh, country in that there's been a strong dichotomy in, in what the political space has allowed to happen at the local level versus what it actually sees at, um, at the national or uh, state level. So let me start with just some facts about uh, what we see in the data. So if you look uh, over the last 50 years, we see very significant advances, as I said, first in education. I think there's been tremendous progress in reducing gender gaps in education across the globe. And in, in many countries now we see uh, the gender gap actually favors women. In terms of political participation, I think we now see universal suffrage in pretty much every country. And in many countries, um, the US being one of them, the gender gap in uh, turnout tends to favor women. So women seem to be more likely to actually participate in politics. In terms of labor force participation, if you look at the lower entry level jobs, you actually now start seeing close to parity. So if I look at entry level jobs in a number of sectors, women form um, an equal share. And indeed, after, th after, for instance, the crisis, the financial crisis in 2008, Many argue that actually women suffered relatively less. Yet on the other hand, if we look at, at its implications in terms of moving up the ladder, we see very limited effects. So less than 20% of the legislators across the world right now are women. And then if we look across corporate boards, we also see very low levels of female presence. So it seems like there's, something, there's some process by which women are managing to get educated, they're managing to get entry-level jobs in some countries, not all, but they're certainly across the board, uh, when it comes to leadership, we see women are, significant, are, are lagging significantly. So, in some sense, what are the stylized facts or the general beliefs out there about why women leadership uh, has failed to take off? So the first kind of evidence you can look at is on attitudes. So you can ask, you know, what are the attitudes we see across the world in terms of female leadership? So we see very little difference across um, stated attitudes among men and women on whether they want to be leaders. So this is both true in the US. If you've done polls with senior level business um, men and women, they will state very similar career aspirations. Similarly, in India, which is where I'm going to show some evidence from, elected female leaders state that they feel as competent uh, to make to, to lead as their male counterparts, and they, are, they state an uh, equal willingness to run. So the, so the first thing that we don't seem to find much evidence for is this idea that um, women, women um, just don't like leadership. However, if you look at um, polls that try to capture attitudes about working women, we've seen very significant change, for instance, in the US and most many countries on the social norms when it comes to leadership, uh, when it comes to, sorry, working for women.
However, if you look at leadership uh, positions, uh, the trends are quite different. So if you ask individuals whether they, whether they would like to have a male or a female as a boss, you're twice as likely to say you'd rather have a man than a woman as a boss. So it seems like while women or men per se don't show much difference in their willingness to be leaders, there's a lot, there's, there is significant difference in some sense in the willingness of the general population to accept them as leaders. The next thing we can ask is, you know, is, what do we know about causation? Should, is, it a, is it a case that when we look across the emerging markets, we just need to think that it's a question of time as they grow faster? Certainly many of the trends, for instance, in labor market positions will start looking like that of richer countries. We find very little evidence of this. Certainly in political leadership across the globe, if you try to correlate income and whether you're a political leader, you really don't see very much. Um, if you look in the corporate board, you again don't see much evidence there. So I'd say overall just, I mean, I'm just going to put that evidence up there. What you tend to see is not very significant, diff, uh, not a lot of evidence that there is that growth in itself will change attitudes or bring about differences in what happens. So I just want to summarize before I turn to, um, turn to the evidence on what in some sense we've already talked about, which is really what are potentially the reasons for the barriers to uh, leadership. And I'd argue it's important to not start in some sense by being the converts, to not start by saying we know that um, there is as much talent and we know that there is discrimination or there are barriers that prevent women and we just need to break them down. I think that it is, one should give a fair shot to the argument that perhaps a lot of what's, what is driving a difference is just difference in preferences or differences in just the jobs that men and women uh, tend to like doing. So a lot of these would be kind of supply side uh, questions. So perhaps this, the cost of entry are different for men and women. Uh, women bear a lot more of the role of childcare, and that possibly influences their ability to enter. They may also have less experience. Some of these, obviously, these supply side arguments are, are, are changeable with public policy. The interesting question on getting evidence on them is to ask what kind of policies can actually change, for instance, differences in the costs of entering politics. And the final one that I've talked about, there's a lot of lab evidence suggesting that women do not like competing. They particularly do not like competing in tournament-style tournament competitions. So if you think of something like leadership positions being positions where you're, going, you're aiming to get one superstar, women might actually prefer not to enter those type of competitions. So a lot of these supply-side factors, when we start thinking about public policy, would have very different implications. They would suggest, for instance, that if the problem is the nature of competition, you might actually want to think about uh, areas with um, you know, proportional representation when several people are being elected at the same time as places where women are more comfortable entering and fighting uh, for a, on a party platform. Now on the demand side, obviously the, you know, the first big uh, thought one might have is that a lot of this reflects just taste discrimination. People just don't like seeing women in positions of power. Um, and interestingly, the difference in thinking about taste discrimination in this setting versus, say, labor markets is, if you remember, sort of, Gary Becker had this famous argument that the reason why taste discrimination would not survive in a labor market is, in the end, labor, people care about uh, getting the most talented individual, and so they may just, over time, choose to undercut um, the wages. I'd rather get a woman cheaper that, who is very able and do well in, in terms of profits. The problem is that entry into political markets looks very different from entry into labor markets. So in political markets, it's only one or two of the top people who very often get the party ticket. So there's not a lot of roo room for a new entrant to come along and say, let me just undercut the going wage, give me a chance and I'll show you I'll do better. It's a much more controlled market with fewer players and that might actually make it harder to get rid of taste discrimination by allowing just more entry. There just isn't a lot of entry. The second form of dis that discrimination might take, of course, is just statistical discrimination, that I don't think women are very good, so I never see women, and therefore I have no reason to change my beliefs about women. 
Uh, again, the fact that political markets tend to have much more restricted entry than other markets might actually lead this to be exacerbated over time. And then the last issue that, as I talked about, which is kind of, you could put it either on the supply and demand side, is really how selection occurs. So we've, we do see evidence across the world that, that legislative systems that have proportional representation tend to bring in more women. This could either be because women are more willing to engage in those competitions, or it could be that you're more willing to elect a woman if you're electing two or three people at the same time. So somehow you don't think the cost is so high, you're more willing to value, for instance, diversity and give women a chance, while if it's a single first-past-the-post system, you'd probably always go uh, with what your prior is the, is the best uh, possibility. So I think that's the background in general about thinking about political leadership uh, under, against which I wanted to introduce the idea of political quotas. Political quotas, of course, remain a very uh, debated issue. They've been, today, over 100 countries across the world have quotas. In politics, I think, somehow the case has been, it seems for a number of countries, easier to make because the efficiency arguments are somewhat less on the table. It's more a case of think, arguing whether we should think that representation requires uh, different groups to be, on, to be represented, and if women are 50% of the population, they should have some representation. If I have some time in the end, which I suspect I won't, I'll say a few words about corporate board quotas. As many of you probably know, Norway has now introduced 40% uh, a requirement that 40% of your corporate board needs to have be women. And there's a lot of talk, especially in Europe, about where, whether this should be expanded. And once you start coming into the private sector, the efficiency arguments become stronger. So, but just to go through it, I think the first, obviously, pro-equity, pro-quota, equity-based argument is that you just increase descriptive representation. You just get more women in. That has to be a good thing, given... Uh, given the fact that women are 50% of the population. Another reason for, for wanting to, uh, uh, women in politics is if we think that men and women differ in just their policy preferences. So if we think men and women are going to value different things, then having women is, as policy makers will actually improve the substantive or the policy representation that women have in policy making. The anti-quota from an equity perspective is this concern that perhaps if you push for women, you actually crowd out some other group, and the group you crowd out might actually be a marginalized group. So for instance, in a lot of uh, emerging markets, the concern is that certain religious groups, which are reasonably marginalized, may actually have stronger social norms against women entering politics. So for instance, in India, it's often said that, well, you push for women, but then you end up getting upper caste women who are from reasonably uh, well-off families, and they displace lower caste women or Muslim women who come from backgrounds where there's, it's harder for them to enter. So you've got more women in, but you only got a particular type of woman in. In terms of efficiency, I think the strongest pro quota argument to me is an information-based argument. That by, by putting women, by requiring you to be faced by having a woman in politics, it makes you change potentially your prize about what women can do. I think a lot of what we think a person is capable of doing is influenced by whether we see them. If you, if you never see women in politics, you're much more likely to think that experience matters a lot, women are not going to do as good a job, they're not willing to work the hours. And possibly, actually, that's one of the biggest um, changes it can bring about in terms of efficiency. It could also have positive externalities. In universities, we often talk quite a lot about the, if the role model effects for students and how, being, um, how seeing a diverse set of faculty members may be important for them when it comes to uh, making career choices. Similarly, one can imagine that if you see women in leadership positions, this may be reasonably empowering for young women. The negative, of course, is that you may be concerned that what quotas do is they reduce the barrier to entry, and so the best performing men are being displaced by relatively poorly performing women. And it could also be that uh, not only do, do they, in the short run, they're worse performing, but this could also lead to uh, worse incentives to invest. So if as a woman I know it's much easier for me to enter politics, I'll perhaps invest a lot less in what I need um, to 
to do well in that field. So that I think I wanted to just broadly lay out the pro and anti quota arguments and suggest that this is really a re reason why we need some evidence on the table. Now notice evidence on the table in some sense may not change your views on quotas per se. So for instance, if my argument for being pro quotas is an equity based argument, my telling you that women are worse leaders may not change it. You might still think that they that you need representation of groups and we can't provide evidence on whether or not they're better or worse as making a case for quotas per se. But I do think evidence is useful. Evidence is useful for us for, us for at least understanding the relevance of different arguments, even if in the end we end up weighing one particular element of it more strongly. Now, how do we go about getting such evidence on quotas? As I said today, over 100 countries have gender quotas, so you might think that one easy way to uh, start getting evidence is simply to look across countries and ask whether countries that went in for quotas early on are countries that actually look much better today on outcomes for women. The problem, of course, is who are the countries that move first? So if you look at, at um, the history of quotas for women in politics, the first country to impose quotas was uh, Norway. So unsurprisingly, that's, that's um, the Nordic countries, the countries with a long history of progressive uh, female policies. Um, the next country that moved was Uganda, then Argentina, uh, followed by a number of Latin America countries, then South Africa, and now increasingly across the board. But you can see that simply comparing uh, outcomes for, uh, for Nordic women with those, say, in uh, Uganda is not going to be a very good test. There is a lot of reason for us to believe that women are going to look as being much more um, powerful in Norway for many other reasons um, in terms of being in positions of power. And so it would be very hard for us to disentangle um, the kind of country that puts a quota in place from the impact of quotas. So that's one reason uh, for focusing on India. Of course, you give up some things by focusing on a single country, and within that a single area, as I will, uh, you know, you have to think much harder about how relevant these estimates are for the rest of the world. But it allows you to deal first order to a first order level with this really concern of selection. So, so India has had, as I said, large scale reservations since 1993 at the grassroots level. It's had um, a very large ongoing debate on these quotas. And the way that they were implemented, which is really the thing that I'm going to make use of, the way they were implemented allows me to say something about, uh, excuse me, about the impact of quotas. So what happened? So in 1993, uh, India introduced both a very decentralized elected um, village governance system called the panchayats, and at the same time, it required that a third of all seats at various levels, elected seats, be reserved for women and that only women can stand for election. They also required that these seats should be, uh, uh, should be rotated so that at every election, uh, a, a seat that was initially reserved should now be moved off. Um, they finally also uh, said that the way of implementing it would be random. So you would essentially go down the list of um, of jurisdictions or seats, typically organized by some administrative number, and then for the first election, pick off one, four, seven, and then in the next election, go to two, five, and so on. So you basically, in effect, had a randomized way of introducing this quota. And that really implies that co village councils that did or did not get exposure to a woman leader were ex ante quite similar, but then deferred um, in whether they were exposed to a female leader, and that's really the question we're going to ask, is having had previous uh, exposure to a female leader, does that actually influence how you perform, how outcomes uh, later on? I think I've talked about all of this. Uh, and there's been very little political manipulation of the reservation system. So many things don't work in India, but somehow the electoral system and the ability to put elections through in a way that they were intended to works pretty well. So We've done a lot of checks on this, and um, it does seem like the implementation was, in effect, random. So what do we find? Let me first summarize for you um, our basic findings, and then actually go through a series of figures that show it. So what we did was we've been working, so this is work I've done with um, uh, several co-authors, including 
uh, Laurie Beeman, uh, who's a Northwestern, Raghav Chattopadhyay, who is in IIM Calcutta, Esther Duflo, who's at MIT, and Petya Topolova, who's at the IMF. And what we did is we've largely been focusing on one area in West Bengal, which is an eastern state, and, uh, and tracking, them, uh, tracking village councils in this area through a series of very detailed surveys um, which occurred at, at several points in time. And this has allowed us to use that data combined with data on electoral outcomes to look at uh, the immediate and long-term impacts. So in terms of the immediate impacts, what we find is, um, is that essentially a previous history of reservation affects who gets elected the next time around. So remember I said that the way reservation works is if you're reserved today, then in the next election, you're, you're, you have open elections. So the first question, of course, is that you know, if women are really terrible, um, then the moment reservation ends, they should, uh, they should no longer be seen on those seats. We should see them being completely replaced by men. But reassuringly, what we do see is we find that if, you've had, if you have had a woman um, as your leader, you're more likely to have, continue to have a woman as a leader after your reservation is finished. We find some evidence that women actually are more effective at providing public goods, and they seem to take less bribes. I want to over-interpret this finding because they're also newcomers, so you could argue that it takes a while to get used to the system to understand how to extract bribes. So I wouldn't look at this and say immediately, oh, you know, women are never corrupt. But certainly in the short run, this is one advantage of getting newcomers in. They, know, they seem to do their job rather than manipulate the system. Um, and as I said, you know, these women are different. They do look different. They're less likely um, to have experience, but it doesn't seem to preclude effective leadership. And they expand the ambit. When we look at the long-term effects, the kind of questions we want to ask is, you know, did this do, does exposure to female leaders change your perceptions about whether women can lead? Does it change the chance that women are reelected? Uh, does it durably change policy outcomes, or is it that after reservation is over, basically all the investments that women make uh, don't uh, remain sustained? And finally, does this change um, aspirations? So do we find any evidence of a role model effect when it comes to, um, when it comes to uh, female leadership? So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to spend something like the next five, seven minutes, just going through a series of bar charts that are going to show you the main results. So the way you should think about these bar charts is we have, two, we have three types of um, village councils. Village councils that were randomly chosen to never have a female leader. Women councils who were randomly chosen to have a female leader once. And because the reservation system is cross-cutting, because there's reservation both for women and for uh, lower castes, Sometimes you would move from being reserved, let's say, for a lower caste woman to being reserved for women in general in the second election. So we also have a group of councils that were actually reserved twice. So we have variation in whether you, you are required to have a female leader for five years, which is one term, or 10 years. And basically what I'm going to show you in the bar charts is the difference in the average outcomes across these three groups. You never had a woman leader, you had a woman leader for five years, and you had a woman leader for 10 years. So what do we see? The so first thing, just to show you that the system works, that if I'm reserved, I get um, a woman leader. So in that sense, this very, very basic concern you may have that people, you may not have, which is that, oh, women just don't want to run for leadership. If you reserve these positions, that women seem to appear from somewhere, right? So you are able to increase descriptive representation by just saying only women can run, right? So there isn't this extreme case that just women shy away so totally that even if they get something easily, they'll choose not to do it. And here we show data both from West Bengal and from the eastern state of Rajasthan, which is arguably a, more a state with more conservative social norms. We see, we see larger levels of participation in the political process. So one of the things that a woman leader is supposed to do is hold Gram Sabha meetings or these village meetings where, um, where villagers come and talk to the leaders about various concerns or issues they have. And what we see is we see uh, women are more likely to come to these meetings, participate in them in terms of talking, when a woman leader is present. We also find um, they, 
women invest more in public goods than male counterparts. So this is just showing you uh, the differences. So um, the, the blue, the, sorry, the yellow is what happens when you're unreserved. The red is what happens when you're reserved. So what you see is that when you look at like water or, and you look at roads, women do more. They do less of some things. So it's not as if there is no distributional implications. So what you find is that adult education centers, which seems to be something that benefits men more, is something that women invest less in. However, overall, um, especially once you start looking after the second term of women, they do seem to just broadly expand public good provision. But certainly, I think this fact is true that men and women have different preferences, and that's showing up somewhat as differences in public good, uh, which public goods they invest in. And when you ask, well, how did they choose which public goods? You can, you can look at, what we did was we looked at transcripts from these village meetings to see what are the types of issues that men and women brought up. And what you find that women are more likely to uh, invest in goods that are aligned with the preferences of uh, fem female villagers. So when we look at the issues which are brought up, we find women are more likely to bring up drinking water and road issues and are less likely to bring up education and that sort of translates to where women uh, are investing. So, as I said, this is the kind of point where it really is, at some level, an ethic, you know, a normative question of how, what we think representation involves. So if you think in a democracy, representation is giving representation to different groups in some proportion to their population share, then this kind of evidence may be enough to make a case for our women. If you think that that, should have nothing to do with it, then you can look at this evidence and say, well, you know, women gain, men lose, so how do we know which way we want to go? So, here's something that you'd argue everyone cares about. So if you look at simply the likelihood of, we asked how, in household surveys, households were asked if they ever had to pay a bribe. Uh, and I should say that all the differences I'm showing you here are significant. Uh, we find that if you were, if you'd had a female leader, and this is for a relatively long amount of time, so this is trying to take away this idea that right at the start, these newbies don't know what they're doing, you do continue to find some difference on a criteria that arguably everyone should care about, how much you, how much you have to bribe. You could possibly think that women care more because it is for water, which is um, a good that women care more about. Yeah. So, the next thing you want to, uh, we wanted to ask was we wanted to know about people's perceptions about whether women can uh, lead. Now, the, a common problem we come across uh, in asking this kind of question in a survey is the, the problem of people say what they think you want to hear. If they see a bunch of college kids uh, coming in and serving in a village, they'll think, well, what do they want to hear? They want us to say we like women, so we'll say that. But that actually may not be what people genuinely think, and that may not be the basis on which they vote when they go to the secret ballot. So in order to try to get uh, better evidence uh, or more believable evidence on preferences, we, we try to follow a number of things that psychologists have done in this area. So the first thing we did was uh, we taped speeches of uh, leaders, of these village leaders in other parts of the state, and then we took the same speech and we, we taped it when it was being read out by a woman and when it was being read out by a man. So the text of the speech is identical, it's just it's being, uh, you hear either a woman speak or a man speak it. We then went to um, villagers and made them hear the speech and then asked them to rank the leader on a number of criteria. Now they never see this leader, they, they're going to have no exposure to leader, apart from the fact that they're just going to hear the speech. And so if if these individuals say that they like the male leader more than the female leader, that's one measure of bias because the speech itself or what was being said was identical. And what you find is that when you look in the areas that had never been reserved, people, people uh, like the male speech more. While if you look at the areas that were ever reserved, that had a female leader, they rank men and women equally. Now if you look at the scale, the scale was how much do you like these people on a scale of one to 10. You could ask this question of, sure there's a difference, but there's a difference of going from you know, 5.8 to um, 5.4. You know, what does that mean? Is that a big difference? We can see some evidence of discrimination, but maybe this is just largely noise. So one way of asking whether these apparent differences in how you judge the same people matters for outcomes is to actually look at um, election outcomes, right? So 
you know, can these kind of small differences really make a difference when you go and choose who you vote for? So when we look at the 2008 election outcome, so this was after three rounds of elections that occurred under the new election system, and we compared um, a set of jurisdictions, none of which had reservation in 2008. So these are all identical jurisdictions in that no one faces um, the requirement to only have women. So you could, in all the jurisdictions being considered, you could either have a man or a woman stand for election. But the difference is in that previous history. Some of them had never had a woman leader, some have had them once, and some of them have had them twice. And if you just focus on the red bar that looks at the likelihood of, of uh, having a female leader, and you just look across the first two, it basically tells you if you were never reserved, the likelihood that you elected a woman was roughly 10%. While if you were reserved twice, that almost doubles to 16 to 17%. So that's one way of trying to think about how changes in perceptions about how you listen to women's speeches, how much you think that actually tells you anything about what women are capable of actually matters is to, is to see that it seems to translate into the likelihood that women both stand for election and win elections. So this, I think, to me, starts moving away from an equity argument to an efficiency argument. You're saying you have these short-run uh, quotas for women, and they actually seem to, to, people seem to actually like women at the end of it. And so you have, in some sense, helped provide religious information about what, what they get if they elect a different type of person. And, and so even if one might have concerns about the distributional implications, this actually tells you short-run quotas may play an important role in changing the information base. The second thing you see also, as I said, is that you don't see a backlash on public policy. So when I look at um, public goods after a reservation is over, we tend to find similar, we tend to find, uh, similar outcomes. Now the last thing that I want to look at is really this question of the role model effect. So what happens when we, when we look into the, into the future and we ask what happens among younger, the younger generation if they see uh, women? So we look at it in two ways. So the first thing we did is we asked uh, parents of teenage children um, for uh, uh, their aspirations for each child. So we asked them, you know, what, what age would you like your child to get married at? What age would you like? What kind of occupation would you like your child to undertake? What are the, what are the, how, much, how much education would you like your child to have? Uh, and would you like your child to be a leader? And then we also uh, interviewed the teenage children in the household and asked them the same questions. You know, would you like to be a leader? What age would you like to get married at? What occupation would you like to do? So unsurprisingly, if you look at the areas that are never reserved, you do see a gender gap in aspirations. So you do see that uh, relative to girls, parents state that they want their boys to get more education, to have more high-powered jobs. And you also see this is reflected among teenagers, even though that gap is smaller, that teenage girls seem to uh, sort of self-state um, lower, lower aspirations for jobs or education. So what we did is we looked at this gender gap, uh, both for parents and for teenagers, and asked how that changes across, um, um, across uh, reservation. And what you see is, I think the main thing to see is to compare the dark box, which is the gender gap um, when you've been twice reserved, with the gray box, which is the gender gap if you've never been reserved. So if you've never been reserved, or you saw a woman leader once, there's basically not much difference. So five years of exposure doesn't seem to matter. But if you've seen two women leaders, and this is where you know, longer run effects seem to matter, what's striking is you see both a decline in the gender gap in parental aspirations, so that's the mean of the gender gap in parental aspirations, and you see a decline in the self-stated difference in aspirations between teenagers. Now what I find exciting about this data is not only do you see this change in aspirations, but it actually seems to translate into what, what happens. So if you look at the third set of uh, blocks, which is educational outcomes. Even though this was an area with a relatively small gender gap in education, there was one, and that completely disappears. So in these villages, if you've had a woman leader for two rounds, you basically no longer see a gender gap in education. And then the last set of um, bars, which are the only one that are negatively um, measured, tell you that relative to boys, girls were doing more domestic chores. So we had a time use data, so we saw how much time they spent on domestic chores. And you actually see that women, girls do less once they've been twice reserved. So it seems like some of this decline in, 
you know, some of this going to school more actually is related also to doing less, less work in the house. So I think th this role model effect seems like a pretty powerful channel when it comes to aspirations. As I said, you know, the nice thing of focusing on a, on a very specific area in the Indian context is that we were able to deal with the selection concerns and really tell you this is causal evidence. The caveat that has on the education data is that obviously we started in a setting where the educational gap was relatively small to start with, so even though it disappears, it would be interesting to know what would happen in other settings where possibly these gaps are larger. And then the last thing is, you might look at this evidence and say, well, sure, you know, women got more, girls got more educated, but is this really about aspirations or is it because uh, maybe there were more drinking water facilities and so they had to spend less time collecting water? So is it aspirations or is it changes in either public goods being provided by women leaders directly or expectations? So we did try to look at this distinction of aspirations or expectations by comparing outcomes for slightly older women. So we look, when we look at women aged 16 to 30, we see no change in outcomes. So it really seems like you know, the, the role model effect or the effect on aspirations and outcomes was really true for younger girls, but not for girls who, by the time they were exposed to women leaders, they'd already entered uh, relatively set patterns. So let me uh, conclude with some thoughts on, I think, where we are, and then uh, maybe open it up for discussion, is I think there is, at least from the Indian context, there is strong evidence that in India, quotas worked, uh, worked as they were intended. If I look more broadly across the globe at the experiences with quotas, we don't have a lot of evidence on how um, quotas have worked in terms of changing policy outcomes, but we have increasingly evidence on how the design of how quotas are implemented actually matters a lot. So for instance, uh, in India, it was a relatively strong form of law that said you need to reserve one third of the seats for women, in France, they had a parity law, so it was a requirement that you could have 50% of your seats that a party puts up has to be women, but you could pay a fine and not put up women. And you find that parties use that option a lot, and so you actually saw them both um, paying the fine, so not putting up as many women, but also putting up women in seats which they believed they were going to lose anyway. Um, so you find it actually in France, and so if anything, the fact that you gave parties all this freedom meant that it increased uh, incumbency advantage for men. In Spain, there's a recent paper, kind of interestingly, which shows you that it was, uh, you had to put women on your party list, and what you find is that women uh, suddenly were being put up who had surnames later in the alphabet than men. So we also know this well-known fact that people tend to pay more attention to names higher on the ballot. And, and so you're just seeing more women lower down. So it does suggest that, you know, it's not as if there are groups that are not losing out. There are groups that are losing out. It's not something that's a win-win situation for all. And particularly the group that at the first pass loses out the most is the existing party politicos. In India, they went in and just very directly cut it by saying, this is the seat, you can only have a woman. In Europe, very often, they're given more flexibility, and we've seen, as a result, mixed effects on descriptive representation. Sorry. And then finally, I wanted to just say one thing about translating this into other domains. As I mentioned, there's increasing interest in thinking about uh, gender quotas on corporate boards. And I'd say that the, I think the discussion there correctly is focused much more on this separate question, which is what are corporate boards supposed to do? In politics, I think there's an easier case to be made that what, what, what you're supposed to do is represent people uh, and their policy interests. But if you think a corporate board is all about protecting shareholder interests, and if shareholder interests are profits, then should, should, the, should the best corporate board be one that comes from the C-suite? And if, this, if there are no C, women who are CEOs, then is this extremely distortionary? So I think there's a, a lot of ongoing evidence or discussion about that, but it seems like even though people are pushing there for gender uh, equity, there's less agreement on what is the objective by which you should measure it. So let me stop there and open it up if there are 
סליחה. Um, I have a question related to the outcomes that you studied. Uh, it seems to be that most of the outcomes are related to how much women participated in the electoral process. And I'm just curious, did you find any differences uh, in places with reservation and without reservation on sort of village level outcomes? You know, you talked about public goods provision, but were there any other welfare indicators to show that these villages that were led by women were doing better? So are you thinking of things like consumption? Um, I'm thinking of things like consumption or you know, the basic uh, education levels within the village or uh, you know, any other things that would suggest that there was economic development occurring. I'm thinking you know, what evidence can be presented to the world to show that yeah. having these uh, quotas and having the women in the leadership positions is actually doing yeah. much better for society. So um, we didn't look, so I, as, as you said, the two things we did look at was basically public good provision, and we looked some at educational outcomes for teenagers, where we saw this reduction in the gap, but not a lot of change in the level. Um, we have not done, in some sense, with the classic, what you'd probably want to look at is just poverty or growth outcomes. We didn't have um, availability to do that uh, entire module. But one thing I should reference, which I haven't here, is work that one of my co-authors, Petia, has done with some others, is they look at crime reporting. And they actually find that um, there seems to be a, an increase in uh, women's willingness to report crimes. So that's another dimension of welfare, that there seems to be increased reporting of, of crimes by women in these, uh, in these settings. So, but yeah, I think the big question about whether women are good for growth, women leaders are good for growth, I don't think. We have bits of evidence that paint some picture I mean, my view would be to say, if, it, if it's made in the long run, if it's made the political process less distortionary in the sense that there are some women who are getting elected without reservation who would not have otherwise, that hopefully means something about their ability. But yeah, we don't have evidence directly on growth. Uh, let me ask a question. So, uh, so women, uh, places where there was reservation uh, women were more likely to get re-elected, but I was wondering whether this was uh, new, new women as well, or it was just the advantages of incumbency. No, it's actually, interestingly in India, there's very little evidence of incumbency advantage. So both among men and women, when, you're, when, you, uh, when there is um, a new election, typically you're not the incumbent. So we looked into that, and most of the women getting elected the second time around were different women. And, but that's true for men as well. So it's not like women are disproportionately disadvantaged as incumbents. There just doesn't seem to be much incumbency advantage in India. Hi. Um, that was very, very interesting. Um, I wanted to ask for your opinion on, in South America, it seems that a number of women have been elected to be presidents, whether it's Argentina or, or Chile Brazil. and now Brazil. Yeah. Uh, what, in your opinion, is working for women in South America that makes it possible for them to be elected president? I'd love to hear your views on that. Um, I mean, I do know that some Latin American countries like Argentina were quite early movers in terms of quotas in legislature. So one view could be that actually quotas in Latin America, which took, started in the 1990s itself, actually set the base for having a group of women that could come. Another thing that I've heard very specifically in the case of Brazil for, um, uh, for the current president is that the large conditional cash transfer program, which you can think is the kind of thing that's a very pro-female policy, it's making transfers to households with children, was something that was seen as, as having benefited her at election time. So there's one view that a lot in Latin America has moved a lot in terms of um, sort of very progressive social policies, and those are things that are often associated more with the women in that legislature. But I have not seen evidence on either corroborating it, but it certainly is very interesting. Especially, let me just add to it, is because I think the other part of Latin America that's somewhat, South America that's somewhat surprising to me is, as I said, unlike the US, you don't, you don't see um, the reduction in the gender gap in education being accompanied by a reduction in the gender gap at entry level labor market. We still see a pretty large gap in South America in entry level labor market conditions. So it's surprising because in that sense, political leadership seems to have gone further ahead than where the labor markets have gone in these countries. 
Um, thanks for a wonderful presentation. Um, I'm very curious. I think this, um, this system that you were um, sharing from India, where you have reserved seats for a certain period and then unreserved seats, is that something that have you seen in other um, countries? Because it seems to be like a really great test to see yeah. what at the end um, you know, naturally um, happens without the quota once you yeah. break these barriers of um, information, exposure, and possibility of yeah. you know, um, seeing change in social norms. Yeah, it's a good question. I was thinking about that actually when I was coming here is that most distinction I've seen people draw is between quotas and proportional representation systems and, par and parliamentary systems. I haven't seen people actually show data on how many places have rotation, so I should actually look into that. So it's a great question. Uh, hi. <clears throat> uh, it, it was a great presentation. Really enjoyed the presentation. Also, uh, it was a very scholarly presentation, which also <laughs> I enjoyed because I'm these days in the business of just saying things without <laughs> evidence. Um, but uh, I, I'm wondering, uh, I know that there is parallel research that's going on. For example, my friend Bruce Kogut has done a lot of work yeah. on looking at uh, 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 quotas for women in corporate boards and how that has yeah. had an impact on, for example, the wage differential and those kinds of things. I mean, do you have any comment on what's happening in parallel in the corporate world? Yeah, so, I, so as I said, I, think, I feel like in the corporate world, the evidence has been quite mixed, both in people's thinking about it, but also that's come out. So, that, so Amalia Miller um, and co-authors have worked, looked at the Norwegian experience. The problem is that the first way you can look at it is hard to interpret, which is what people do is an event study. So they look in Norway and they said just after, this was a surprise announcement, what happened? Well, stock market prices fell, but you know, that could just be because people still discriminate. You know, suddenly being told, oh, you have to change your board to be 40% women, you know, maybe stock market prices just fall because it's expectations, not actually ability. What seems to have happened is um, this requirement of having 40% uh, women, to the extent that people try to often get women from within their, the business world, you, a lot of these women are coming much more from the HR groups because it seems like women in, in a lot of corporate settings tend to be more concentrated in the HR group than say in the supply chain provision. So then some of the effects you're seeing much more are on, are on labor market policy. So you find that having women means that they, they respond differently, they fire less, they tend to have um, labor market policies that are more conciliatory to the unions. Uh, so it's hard to know how much of that is the fact that they're coming from HR versus the fact that they are women. Um, but in general, I think people's views in the short run, it seems to not have been great for profits. So like organizations like the Catalyst in the US have made like this very strong business case for women. But in the very short run, if you look at just profits, it's not there. But at least for me, that's not the most interesting piece of evidence. We want to kind of understand a lot more uh, how it does. The worrying side of it, at least in Norway, is there's some evidence of firms trying to strategically escape it. So the two ways you can escape it is one is by not registering as a public company, so going private. The other is to register, for instance, on the London stock market rather than the Norwegian market. So, if, so again, going a little bit back to the political quota example, the question is how much leeway do they have? Thank you for your presentation. I had a question kind of getting back to Catalyst's work in, yes. in the US. Um, there's been kind of a backslide in female leadership in the corporate world. And um, I know you didn't really touch on this, but if you had any thoughts about um, political representation and the feedback loop between corporate world and, and that sort of thing, and maybe kind of putting that in the context to what's happened the past decade yeah. in the US. I think that's a great question. It's something I've, I've wanted to work on. I haven't quite figured out how to work on yet, so I don't have very coherent thought on it. But it is interesting to me how little, so it seems like that actually, in, at least in a lot of countries that have had quote, political quotas, like I think South America is a great example, we're not seeing a lot of spillovers to what's happening in um, the corporate sector or the management sector, the labor market sector. I'm trying to understand, is it that people sort of have this huge mental accounting where they, they decide politics is all about being ethical and having representation, but these don't apply to the corporate sector, or it's something more, I'd love to try to understand that more. I think we don't understand that very well. When you talk to people in Norway and you ask them why did, why did they go for corporate board quotas, I mean, the claim there seems to be it's just kind of 
a lucky accident, two men went into a room and came out and made this announcement. Uh, there wasn't a huge, uh, there wasn't a huge amount of like lobbying and things going on there. So.